until we meet at the next point. So how complex is simple enough? So just because you can engineer it and build it doesn't mean you should. So always being cognizant of what the end goal is and then designing your organ on a chip or integrated organs on a chip to meet that goal. So you're always balancing engineering and complexity because you want a robust model that can give you reproducible results, but you also want a physiologically complex one. So figuring out how complex you need it and then patient-specific predictions using patient cells to do drug screening and, and disease modeling to find the best drug for you, you know, based on, on your cells based on. The cells generate a structure that has the properties of the organ from which they come from. That is a huge advance. And so previous to this, when we had used spheroids, they, they had a modicum of that, but not much. When we use cells, they don't have any real organotypic properties uh, as monolayers or in suspension color, culture. But now we've got something that actually has the function of the organ from which it came from. And that is a huge advance in my opinion. Richard, I remember seeing those mini guts and seeing the crypt base and the villa in the center and seeing those movies and just being fascinated by it when I first saw it. I mean, it's fascinating to see these things. I'm extremely fascinated by the great variety of neuroendocrine cells that somehow connect uh, neuronal stimuli to, to the activity of our, of our gut. So uh, it's truly a world to be discovered and we are very excited that here at MSK and throughout the world we are making progress. Uh, thank you Alejandro for three great questions. Um, yes, there are many uh, published data um, from the um, prestigious journals, uh, especially in the area of the personal medicine uh, studies, that they, they show the organoids can be used um, as a predictive marker for cancer patients. Their data shows 100% um, uh, negative prediction. So if, for example, a drug uh, didn't work in uh, um, in uh, in organoids, uh, in assay with organoids, uh, the drug also didn't work in uh, in patient, and uh, there is 90% positive prediction. So if the drug works in uh, assay with organoids, it also worked in uh, in patient. So uh, organoids represent a really powerful tool in drug uh, development discovery. For them, these organoids. Um, uh, are suitable for uh, mimicking and reproducing phenotypes of certain detection of certain different patients. So, for example, this is um, um, uh, a video where you can see how inside of a lung organoids certain mucus is generated, and because of the uh, synchronized beating cilia uh, present in the epithelia of this lung organoid, indeed, this mucus is kind of rolling inside of the lumen of this lung. On, on using these models to better predict outcome in patients, uh, I think we are ready to move in a high throughput system. Um, when I was a postdoctoral fellow in the Tubison lab, I collaborated with uh, Bernalise and her laboratory at Scripps, Florida to move into such a high throughput pipeline. Uh, so it is possible. It does require some considerations uh, about how you set up the assay to make sure that the automation is compatible with the culture conditions. Uh, but we definitely think it is possible and it should be uh, at least attempted right now to, to ensure that these models are indeed better than the conventional cell line models that we've used previously. Mm -hmm. How do you overcome these, um, this, these challenges uh, for moving 3D uh, into high throughput in, in your lab? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. Uh, every cell is different, so it's definitely a challenge every time we got a new project. Um, for the project that we did in collaboration with Hervé and Dr. Tubison, they uh, grow these organoids uh, all the time in 3D using these matrices, and then when we got the assay in our lab, we were facing, okay, we wanted to make it HD as amenable, how we can do that? So one of the ways is that we were able to grow these organoids in a, as a 2D monolayer and then harvesting the cells and then being able to use ultra-low attachment plates successfully and also repellent plates depending on the method and being able to adapt these cells and these organoids um, in 3D format. Uh, which at the moment are our major, our major uh, maybe also hurdle but also our major activity and it is because um, 
it is of course entirely new uh, using patients' own cells that are all a little bit different uh, in order to get a diagnostic result on time, uh, but that it's still valuable for the patient. If we give a result six months later, it's obviously entirely useless. So we need to set up these, these things. And I think you know, on the, the technical side, does an organ or critic patient outcome? We're very confident that it is working. We've seen that in us and other people's studies. But now we have to do the regulatory test. It has to be standardized and it has to be fast. And so that is our main, main uh, thing. So uh, to do to the count, this is a quantified result. In the mock condition, 100% of mice are very healthy. In the Zika affected condition, we have a quarter of them develop partial paralysis and a quarter of them develop, develop paralysis. In the HH treated condition, there is no animal developed paralysis. So we are currently working on the lead optimization and try to uh, push it to preclinical study. And then COVID come. So this is a screenshot from the Hopkins website. Uh, which I took around one week ago when I made slides and as you know the numbers still keep increasing both in US and globally. To want a stemless phenotype but all the stem cells are stuck in that state? Um, no, because we checked if our organoids are still composed of other differentiated cells such as um, goblet cells. So here you have a PAS staining monitoring the mucin, so you can see that in standard you have goblet cells, same as uh, in our organoids cultivated in stainless condition.